Just a little while ago, I met an honest-to-goodness rock star in an elevator. Or at least I kind of did. And just wait till you hear what we talked about. Okay, this is gonna sound really weird, but if you hang in there, I think you'll like where I'm going. The other night I couldn't sleep, that's pretty usual for me. So I started wandering around the house looking for a new spot to sleep, hoping that would do the trick. And when I finally did fall asleep in the wee hours of the morning, we're talking two or three in the morning, I had this really vivid dream that kind of stuck with me when I woke up. Now I know, the last thing you wanna hear is about my dream. And I can't tell you how many times people come up to me after I'm speaking at a live event to tell me about some wacky dream that goes on and on and on and on until I'm trying to escape from them. So, I mean, I know firsthand that the telling of dreams isn't very popular, but at least you're not trapped. I mean, you have the ability to turn this show off at any moment. So here goes. I dreamed I was walking across a college campus, which isn't all that unusual because well, I have these recurring nightmares about college where I'm late for class and I can't find the classroom or I'm desperately trying to find the place where the final exam is being administered. But this time, it wasn't a nightmare. I was walking across this college campus with Sting, you know, the famous singer, and I was asking him questions about what it's like to be a celebrity. What's the hardest thing about being famous? How do people treat you? How do you wish people treated you? And honestly, I have no idea what Sting is like in person, but I will tell you this. The dream version of Sting is very cordial, and he made lots of time for talking as we strolled across the campus. And then at one point, we went inside a building and got into this elevator. And as the doors were closing, he sighed and he said this, the hardest thing about all of this is that people treat me differently. And that's when I woke up at about, I don't know, 4.30 in the morning, and I guess it kind of stuck with me, not because I'm famous, but because I do lead something of a public life. I've been doing that for the last quarter century or more. And not to get too new agey, but I suspect this dreamland celebrity was actually reflecting my own feelings back to me. Again, it's not that I'm famous, because obviously I'm not. But in some Christian circles, not many, but in some Christian circles, I am somewhat recognized because, well, sometimes because of the books I've written or because of my work in TV and radio. So that would make me what, a Z-list celebrity? Because apart from the handful of people that listen to me once a week, nobody really knows me. And to be honest, that's kind of the way I like it. There are people who crave having their name out there and I'm most decidedly not one of those people. In fact, some people are surprised to learn that I'm an introvert. I prefer peace and quiet in places that are away from people. But all the same, I have led something of a public life and it's given me a lot of reasons to reflect on the way that human beings treat each other. I mean, I'll admit, there was a definite difference once I obtained a modicum of recognizability. Suddenly, people liked me because they'd seen me on TV. And when I stepped into a church where people knew me, I was treated like royalty. And my wife was not. Not until they realized we were married. And it always bothered me that we got different treatment. And I knew I would have gotten different treatment too if the gathering had no idea who I was. Which brings me to the subject of how we tend to value people. Human nature seems to be wired such that we instinctively treat people well if we think they can do something for us. And we tend to ignore them if they can't. Maybe one of the reasons we tend to idolize the rich and famous is because we somehow hope that we can hitch our own wagons to their success and go along for the ride. But you know, as soon as a celebrity plummets from grace or falls into hard times, people drop them like a hot potato and move on to something else. These people were being used. I've noticed this happens a lot to child actors who are the darlings of the entertainment world one day, but then find themselves on the outside as soon as they're no longer cute or when they have to live through the perils of adolescence under public scrutiny. I mean, how many child celebrities haven't you seen going off the rails when the artificial life they've been forced to live suddenly catches up with them? And they begin to suspect that they're nothing more than a product, a ticket to wealth for somebody else. 
And while it's painfully visible on the stage of fame and fortune, the same does hold true for most of us. At some point in our lives, we get this nagging feeling that people only value us as long as we're useful to them. The idea that somebody might actually love you just for who you are, well, most of us realize that's actually pretty hard to find. It's an idea that you find buried in a famous story that Jesus told in the pages of the New Testament. The son of a wealthy man demands his inheritance early so he can go out and make a life for himself. And he stumbles into the painful reality of a world that only values you if they find you useful. Here's what it says. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. It's a story that ends on a really lonely note, a note that resonates with most of us. Now, it doesn't explicitly say this, but when this boy had money, he had friends. And we know that because, well, it's hard to live a prodigal existence by yourself. The old King James Version says he was in riotous living, which is really hard to do alone. Now, it is a fictitious story, but the teller of the story is giving us an honest assessment of the world we live in. When you're able to do something for people, when you're paying for the party, you have lots of so-called friends. But the moment that's over, those ephemeral friendships just evaporate and you find yourself keeping company with pigs. That's a painful reality for most people. We feel like we're only valued for what we can do for somebody else. You know, a few years back at the peak of my career, I fell sick with this mysterious illness and it became Severe enough that I had to suddenly step down from the job I had. Just a few months previous, people wanted to be my friend. But as soon as it was obvious that I could no longer carry on with my duties, I could suddenly count the number of real friends I had on the fingers of one hand. I mean, a handful of people sent me get well cards and then I never heard from them again. Now, part of that is just the reality of life. Most of my acquaintances were work acquaintances and so I mean, of course they had to get on with life. That's perfectly normal. And I've been guilty of doing the same thing. The mere act of surviving in this world is an all-consuming task. And when I was no longer a regular part of many people's work lives, well, it only made sense there was a drop-off. It makes sense to me. I mean, you often see the same thing happening at funerals, where the congregation has to get back to the business of living tomorrow, and the bereaved are left alone when the service is over. It just happens, and it's not really anybody's fault. But still, underneath that, we all have this nagging sense that most people only value us if we're useful. Now, I do have to take a quick break, but when I come back, we're going to talk about the way the Bible offers a solution to that problem. I'll be right back after this. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. We're back. Just before the break, I was talking about the way we tend to value other people and how we tend to prize people more if we think they can do something for us. Here in the West, people love celebrities because somehow they feel that they're tapping into those people's success just by making contact with them. I mean, just watch the way that people name drop, hoping that you will place a higher value on them because they once met someone famous. We have this awful propensity for using people instead of loving them. And then suddenly, 2,000 years ago, a rather remarkable man suddenly appeared in our midst and started treating people, well, well differently. Let me read you a story that, that appears more than once in the pages of the New Testament. And I think we'll look at the version that's found in the Gospel according to Mark. Here's what it says now in Mark chapter 2. 
as he, that's Jesus, as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. Now, here's what we should probably understand about this story. If we think nobody likes the IRS today, back in Jesus' day, tax collectors were even more unlikable because they worked for the Romans, and the Romans were an occupying power. A tax collector was considered a traitor, and of course, nobody likes a traitor. The story continues. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees, those were the respectable religious leaders of the day, when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? Now, let's be clear about what's actually happening in this story. These tax collectors have nothing to offer Jesus, except, you know, maybe letting Jesus slide a little on his taxes, something Jesus would never do. These people have nothing to offer Christ except love and respect. They can't advance his public ministry. They can't boost his popularity in the polls. In fact, hanging out with Jesus is probably going to do precisely the opposite. And yet, there he is, hanging out with these people because he values them. And they don't love him because he's wealthy or because he can help them climb the corporate ladder. In fact, the Bible tells us Jesus wasn't wealthy. He had nowhere to lay his head. This is a story that runs completely contrary to our normal expectations. I mean, imagine someone who loves you just because you're you, not after you change to become something more lovable, not because you can do something for them, just because. It runs completely contrary to the way we expect the world to operate, which is obvious from the outraged comments of the influential people who witnessed Jesus eating with these people. How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? You know, over the years, I've had the opportunity to do quite a bit of travel, enough that I've built a little bit of status with some of the airlines. And I'll admit, I mean, psychologically, the airlines really know what they're doing with those loyalty programs. I mean, you get to board the plane first, they greet you by name, they recognize your status, you get a special check-in line, and even the occasional upgrade to first class. And it works because psychologically it feels really good to be recognized. But underneath it, you know you're not being recognized because the airline loves you. You're being recognized because you represent revenue. And the moment you don't fly enough is the moment you get sent to the back of the plane. And that's the world we live in, the world we expect, where status is awarded based on your utility. And it's been that way since the dawn of recorded history. But then that history is dramatically interrupted by a man who operates by a completely different set of rules. When Jesus was challenged by the temple authorities to prove that he had the authority to teach, he responded by saying, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Now, compare that to the world we live in, a world where personal entitlement is the rule of the day. I mean, we've all heard those stories where customers scream at a clerk, don't you know who I am? We are so desperate to be valued. I find it interesting that it's often celebrities who act out like that. And, and most of us, unfortunately, love those stories where celebrities throw a pump like temper tantrum because in our minds, they just got taken down a notch. And if they've been taken down a notch, maybe the rest of us can prove we're just as valuable as those people and, well, maybe even more valuable. It's the double-edged sword of modern celebrity. If we think someone can do us a favor, we treat them like gold. But as soon as it's obvious they can't or won't, we suddenly want them to fall off their perch and we experience a great deal of schadenfreude when they do. We love it. Whether it's Miley Cyrus who fails to get recognized at a burger stand or Faye Dunaway getting her credit card declined, part of us loves that because the mighty get served a slice of humble pie. I mean, I'll be honest. The fact that Jesus offended the religious authorities by fraternizing with the lowest rung of the social ladder, I, I, I kind of enjoy it. 
But really, we need to ask ourselves why. Why do we bask in the moment when the most celebrated members of society suddenly have that value stripped away? I suspect that at least to some degree, it's because we all fear the same thing might happen to us. We fear that our personal value might be hanging by a thread. And that's where the person of Christ suddenly grabs our attention. I mean, who is this man who turns social values on their head and hangs out with low lowlifes and hookers? Who is this man who touches lepers and has all the time in the world for a woman who has been condemned by absolutely everybody for being a homewrecker? I mean, what kind of a leader builds his personal cabinet from uneducated laborers and hot-tempered fishermen? Jesus is nothing at all like the world we're used to. So, let's go back to the prodigal son sitting in that pig pen. When the money runs out and his friends disappear, this is the thought that pops into his head. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, remember this. This is the kid who squandered his inheritance, who abused his father's kindness, and who put himself ahead of everybody else and then foolishly threw his privileged life in the trash. This is a spoiled rich kid who shared his father's name and dragged it through countless bars and brothels, doing untold damage to the family reputation. He quite literally has nothing to offer his dad, and yet he discovers his father waiting in the road, hoping he'll come back. So who is this man who walks among the rejects? If you have seen me, Jesus said, you have seen the Father. I'll be right back after this. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. You know, the real question we should probably be asking ourselves about this story is what it says about the way that you and I treat other people. I know that Christians have developed an unfortunate reputation for treating people badly. And unfortunately, I think that to some extent, Christians should probably own that. I mean, we can be judgmental and we can develop an us and them mentality designed to reassure ourselves that, well, we aren't as bad as other people. And because of that, a lot of people have no idea what this book actually says, because Christians sometimes get in the way of that. Not only do we have the example of Jesus, but we also have a number of pointed statements that remind us of how God expects us to value other people. I mean, just listen to this statement that comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, starting in chapter 2. It says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. That's a good example. How about this one over in the book of James? This is such a profound reversal of the way we usually think that I'm going to read quite a bit of this passage. Here's what it says. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. In other words, you can't rightfully call yourself a Christian if you treat people the same way the rest of the world does. He continues, For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here by my footstool. Have you not showed partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? 
Now notice, that language is really pretty blunt. The Bible considers valuing people who can do things for you while devaluing the ones who can't to be an act of evil. That's strong language. It continues, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So according to James, this is not just a matter of courtesy or civility. This is actually a matter of breaking the moral law of God. And to be honest, this is a pretty bitter pill to swallow for most people, especially here in America. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm a huge fan of the American dream where people are said to be equal before the law and everybody has the same shot at prosperity. I like the idea that we make room for an individual's potential and the idea that we want to remove barriers to success. But at the same time, we seem to make idols of people who actually make it, placing them higher up than everybody else. And you've got to wonder, is that what God would want? Listen, I've been working for the nonprofit world for decades, which means that I have to attend a lot of fundraisers. And of course, when it comes to fundraising, people naturally gravitate to the rich and famous because, well, it seems like those kinds of people could probably make our lives a whole lot easier if they wanted to. And years ago, I was attending a fundraising dinner where somebody suddenly grabbed me by the elbow and pointed to this lady who was sitting at a table on the other side of the room. You see her, they whispered. She has a lot of money. You should probably go over there and pay attention to that lady. Now, now honestly, I, I kind of understand the sentiment. I mean, we were raising money for a really important cause. And, and personally, I want to believe this person that said that really meant well and was only trying to find a way to help. But there was something about that that didn't sit right with me. Not when the Bible demands that we do not idolize the rich and the powerful. Now again, it is a double-edged sword, let's be real, because at the same time we need to recognize that powerful people also need love. And honestly, a lot of them seldom get the real thing. And they live under the awful impression that people only love them for their money. I mean, you'll notice that Jesus also made time for the rich and famous like he did for Nicodemus. But to treat people differently, the Bible calls that sin. Okay, I do have to take one more quick break, but when I come back, I'm going to show you a story that demonstrates exactly how God thinks about us. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers and guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. In the moments that we still have together, let me show you another story that really illustrates what God expects us to do. This one is found in the Gospel according to Mark, and it's in chapter 12. Here is what it says. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury, and many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrans. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, 
her whole livelihood. You and I tend to value the powerful because we think they can somehow help us. And to be honest, there are lots of powerful people who do help the world as much as they can. I mean, the powerful and the rich are not all out there evicting widows and tying people to the train tracks. I never want to feed the unfortunate stereotype of the self-absorbed wealthy because, well, it, it is a stereotype. In reality, the rich and powerful are no more self-absorbed than the rest of us. We just pick on them because, well, they're more visible. And many of them, I can tell you firsthand, are profoundly generous. I have experience with that. But at the same time, take a look at how Jesus viewed the subject of giving. Lots of people were dropping by the temple to make a donation. And some of those donations were very impressive. They impressed the disciples. But then Jesus sees a widow who drops in two mites. That's 1 64th of an average day's pay, or 15 minutes of work. And that's what grabs the Son of God's attention. She gave me everything she had, he said. And it warmed his heart because that was the image of God. Most of us at some point wake up and realize that we're sitting in the pig pen of this world with the prodigal son. And we're only allowed to be there because the owner of the pig pen thinks we're barely useful enough to feed some pigs. We're utterly miserable the way we are, but still in that condition, we're still being used. So maybe it's possible that you've been looking for love in all the wrong places. Maybe it's possible you've been asking the wrong people for an estimate of your worth. And maybe it's time to open this old book and discover that things are worth what people are willing to pay for them. And this book says, the Son of God was willing to pay for you with His life. Maybe it's time for all of us to start looking at people the way God sees them, whether they're rich or poor, famous or infamous. Maybe it's time to re-examine the words of the carpenter of Nazareth who said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Maybe you haven't read this book in a long while. Maybe you've been taking people's word for what this book says. So I'm going to encourage you. Now I'm going to challenge you to pick this up and read the words of Jesus for yourself and see if they don't ring true. And I want you to discover for yourself that God values you much differently than the way people do. I'm Sean Boonstra. This has been Authentic.